Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPad and iPhone, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPad and iPhone, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disc Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. And by lynda.com, the unparalleled online video training library. For a free 10-day unlimited trial, visit lynda.com slash macvoices. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this time around, we're going to discuss home automation. There's so much discussion around intelligent assistance and voice commands and all kind of gear, obviously Apple's HomeKit. I thought it would be interesting to have a bit of an objective conversation about this, especially before the, the upcoming September 9th announcements. Not that I know anything, not that I even suspect anything, but you know, you got to wonder when the, when the hint is, hey, Siri, give us a hint. Uh, that there there might be something that has to do with Siri. First up, though, let's introduce the panel. Uh, going from left to right on my screen, first up, Ms. Shelley Brisbane. Shelley, it's great to have you back. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Chuck. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to have you. Do I did I remember right? Didn't don't you have a new podcast going? I do. There's a rumor to that effect. So I started a podcast called The Parallel. And the point is, it is a tech podcast with accessibility sprinkles. I have a background both in uh, mainstream technology, but also in accessibility. I'm visually impaired, and I do some writing about it. And the feeling I had was that people in those two communities didn't talk enough together and with enough understanding. And it's not about kumbaya, but it is about having good tech conversations that are informed by, but not dominated by accessibility. I'm at episode two, and you can find that at brisbane.net for the moment until the domain gets up and running. But uh, we had uh, Allison Sheridan and Allison Hartley on episode two last week, and had a lot of fun and hope for more good episodes in the future. Episode number three has got to be better since Allison and Sheridan <laughs> won't be there. Oh, that's right. We have feuding between uh, Chuck and Allison. That's not, right. Not I, really feuding, just <laughs> feuding. Okay, feuding's no. a good feuding's a good word. <laughs> yes. Uh, before I forget, though, you say uh, the, the the site is not up yet. Is it in available in iTunes yet? Through yes, the, the it feed? is. What I did was uh, I put the site up in. Uh, in, on my domain in order to beta test it a little bit. And uh, our mutual friend, Allison, kind of outed me before I was ready. And so uh, you can find it at brisbane.net uh, slash the parallel. It's, it's linked from the front page. But uh, the, the real proper site for the show will be up this weekend. But you can subscribe in iTunes or RSS or any other way your podcast heart desires. Great, great. Also with us, we have Mr. Brett Terpstra, developer extraordinaire. Brett, it's great to have you. Thanks for uh, being here again, as always. Always a pleasure. Yeah. So, I, you do. I mean, you do development. You do podcasts. I, I lose track of everything you do. Me too. <laughs> that's that's why I do half the stuff I do is just to keep track of my own life. Ah. Um, but yeah, I've got uh, got systematic and overtired with Christina Warren on ESN.FM, and then I have my blog where I, it's been quiet for a week because I actually took a vacation, but. Uh, my work with uh, Mark II, my main application, and then we're working on a, a new NB Alt commercial version, which everyone's very. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure there, but um, yeah. So th those would be my my main things if someone asked me in an elevator. Wow, that's that's a pretty good uh, little set of things to be working on, and that, yeah, you know, and then there are all those little little side projects that you just kind of dash off once in a while and say, here this. You might enjoy this. This might be cool, and then everybody pounces on you. I just did one of those. Did you? <laughs> what I was finished it? it just as you called. It, uh, it, it. You just click a button, and it takes all the open tabs in Chrome or Safari and makes a collection page that you can share with one link. And then people can just click one link and open all the same tabs. Wow. Post meeting, you know, like when you've got like all your tabs up. Yeah, it'll be good. Okay. So, so <laughs> when now that you've now that you've spilled the beans when will that be available i'll put it up tomorrow okay so by the time this show goes up there's a good chance it will be available at brettterpstra.com great thanks so much that's great <laughs> i thought you two would be really interesting to talk to when it comes to home automation as i said in the introduction it's such a hot topic right now and and, and I, I can't decide whether i'm excited about it or whether it's just you know the, the latest thing to try to sell us hardware and services 
Um, my experiences, my personal experiences with Siri have been very good. Uh, I, I do wish it would do a little more. Who knows? Maybe next week it will. I did take advantage of uh, on, on announcement day and, and bought an Amazon Echo. Um, and I like that too as well. But I find myself more and more saying exactly what am I supposed to do with this thing? Uh, and I, w without adding expensive switches for lights and appliances. So I'm kind of curious to see if you two have been on the home automation bandwagon um, at all. And if, if so, what your experiences are and where you want to go with it. Shall we? How about if I if I start with you? Have you have you dipped your toe, toe into anything but Siri? Sure. Um, I have a Nest thermostat, and I really do enjoy it. I haven't spent as much time changing the temperature at my house remotely. Although when I'm on vacation, every once in a while, I'll check to see that Away is is enabled so that I'm not wasting air conditioning. Because here in Texas, air conditioning is very important to us in August, and I was just out of the state for a week, and so that was nice. Um, I have a curmudgeonly streak. And so I tend not to buy things just for the sake of buying them. They have to be actually interesting and practical to me. And so the Nest certainly messed that, met that test. I had a chance to see it in operation in my uh, sister's house. And so I said, that that seems like a good thing. I'd like that. And so I've been pretty happy with it. But I haven't done a lot of other home automation beyond Siri. And I, you know, the idea of controlling lights by automation is only interesting to me in terms of maybe outside lights and security and stuff like that. But just to do it for its own sake uh, doesn't really compel me that much. And, and I'm cheap, and I'd rather spend it on Apple products. So, <laughs> <laughs> Brett, how about you? Have you dipped your toe into the Internet of Things? I could spend the entire podcast telling you about it. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I bought my first X10 module in 1997. And I have uh, I've wired up entire homes. I've had two, three homes since then. Not homes, but apartments and houses. But uh, yeah, I've spent massive amount of time scripting lights and adding proximity detectors. And um, lately, I've been setting it up so that a couple taps on my watch and I can control lights in the house. And uh, yeah, it, it goes on. I, I actually started with voice recognition back in about, would have been about 2003. Uh, with early on, like, uh, naturally speaking, Dragon, uh, and then having that, I had mics wired up around my house so I could just say, turn the lights on from anywhere, and my lights in that room would come on, and yeah, it's been crazy. Okay, now, for some reason, that doesn't exactly surprise me about you. It shouldn't. No, it, sh it really shouldn't. But I, I have to ask you, is this just one of those things that being the, the geek that you are, and I mean that only with, with love and respect, oh, um, th th that, you know, you're doing it kind of because you can? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like, the amount of effort that I put into my home automation systems is uh, it, nobody should have to do. Like, that's what's beautiful about the home kit and the new accessories, even like Hue light bulb and the Nest, is they do what I've been, tr you know, struggling to do for years, but they do it in like a plug and play, just works kind of way. So you don't have to spend, you know, three days writing out visual basic script to make something happen when something else happens. And I'm excited about the future. But it means I have to replace all my hardware. But yes, <laughs> I, uh, I, I do this because it's um, a hobby not because I think it's necessary or practical. So why hasn't it become a little bit easier? Why hasn't, why has, I mean, everybody seems to be hot on it right now, but nobody seems to be taking it that, that, that extra step. And, and the U-Light bulb may have been one of the first ones that, that did try to get us to that extra step. But it also exposes the problem. Everyone's creating proprietary interfaces. Like we've had X10, Insteon, and then uh, there's four other major communication systems for home automation. And now, uh, like Hugh and Philips is creating their own proprietary systems. So you can have all these different light bulbs and switches and they won't work together, which is what hopefully HomeKit is going to make happen. And once there's a centralized you know that any hardware you buy is going to work with your existing system. It'll go nuts. It'll explode at that point. Shall we? I, I'm listening to what Brett says, and, and, I'm, and I'm agreeing a lot with it. I'm just hoping that HomeKit can, can pull it off, because if not, then we have yet another standard to deal with. And, and that's been one of the frustrations for me when I started to look at some of this stuff is 
I don't want to spend money on on junk, and I don't want five or six different uh, systems running in my house. Just just because I mean, look, I'm I'm as much I'm not I'm not the geek Brett is, but I'm I'm enough of a geek that I enjoy playing with this stuff, but not not trying to keep it running all the time and not at that price point. Yeah, I think uh, we we talked about doing X10 back in the '90s. My husband is a software engineer, and he was kind of interested in it, but we never did it, and it probably was because. We could control a few lights, but unless we really made it an avocation and spent a lot of time doing it, and oh, by the way, X10 would have had to continue to develop in the absence of all these other standards that have come on along since, um, that, that's kind of why we let it drop. And I think, think one thing that HomeKit should let people do is see what's possible and what's interesting to them. Because I can talk all I want about being not all that interested in controlling my inside lights with uh, with HomeKit or some kind of technology, but I'm entirely prepared to meet something that some application developer has created that I don't expect right now that's really interesting to me. The other day I heard about, I don't know what standard it is under, it's not HomeKit, I don't believe, uh, but I heard about a a system that allows you to, uh, via the internet, see who's at your front door. And that seems like a great idea for some people. And I think it's going to be really application driven. When people see stuff, whether it's in the Apple store or whether it's just in the news that meets a specific need that they have, the the, the market will make it possible for, I mean, HomeKit as a, as a standard, assuming it's, you know, technically a good standard. And uh, then it's, it seems like that's going to excite people, the availability of a lot of new applications and I'll probably end up breaking down and getting a few things I don't know I want yet. I have to say that I did just install a ring doorbell. I, I broke down after a lot of recommendations, notably by Ted Landau, who was telling some stories on, on Mac Voices a couple months ago, and I got it and installed it. And I'm in the process of, of calibrating it for motion detection, but I'm surprised at how, how well it works, how, how nicely it works, how convenient it is. And you know, maybe I'm just selling it to myself, but there's definitely a sense of security that, okay, if somebody rings the bell, they're going to get a response from a live person, me, whether I'm here or not. Brett, it is, am I being sold something here? I, I mean, have you, have you delved into the ring doorbell or anything like that in your setup? Um, I have not. Um, I, the most I've done in that area is motion detectors on the porch because I don't care who's at my door uh, it's never been a concern i know i don't answer it <laughs> i'm a hermit but um to, to the the central brain point there's software for the mac that's been around for a few years now called indigo and it can interface with any kind of power line or rf controller and it can interface with multiple ones and create a central system like i have i have an old x10 network still running and insteon all combined so i can create single actions like uh and then it works on your phone that's my office and i can tap any of those elements and control lights or control entire like scene settings um so those are all on different hardware and you can make it work but that's what i'm saying is nobody should have to do that so if if any whether it's ios or mac or you know any desktop system or echo if anything makes it possible to just plug it all in and go, I, I, then it will make sense for, for you. The, the Echo experience has been interesting. And of course, I had to do a little bit of self-examination and decide, okay, am I comfortable with having this device sitting here listening to everything that goes on in my house? And, you know, I mean, it's Amazon. So... I'm not as worried as I might be if it were Google or Microsoft. <laughs> um, I'm a little, but I definitely wish it, I would prefer it to be Apple. And the idea that I can just, I mean, sometimes I can shout from the other room, uh, you know, hey, I'm not going to do it now because it'll trigger her. But, uh, <laughs> you know, hey, you, you know, what's the weather going to be? Or, you know, play this music or, you know, from my library. And it, and it comes up. So it's, it's very convenient. Um, Is it better than Siri? Only from only from the standpoint that it is always on, and only from the standpoint that the mics connected to it do seem to be better. I've and I've not had a device that I wanted to sacrifice to just put Siri on all the time and have her listening. But but Siri to me is so much more useful because I can set reminders. I can add things to my calendars. Um, I can without jumping through hoops. I can add things to a shopping list. I obviously can play music. I can make phone calls. 
series seems already a lot more fully formed. And I'm hoping we see more of that. What I what I personally would like to see, Brett, is something that, that you sort of are, are alluding to. I'd like to see it to be able to trigger certain actions in certain apps that would then let me do do things, whether it's it's to something physical or in an application. If I recall, at last WWDC uh, keynote, they talked about an API for Siri, didn't they? When they were discussing deep linking and everything, I, I swear they were they were talking about allowing uh, developers to add their own commands to Siri via applications. But I could be it might have been a dream because so you're right, that, that would but, be amazing. It would be well. It would, HomeKit's got APIs too, so I would would hope that there would be some linking there. And I mean, that's the kind of thing that would be interesting to me as far as what Siri could do, because you talk about playing music, which is sort of the baseline application that everybody talks about with Siri. Well, I run Siri, uh, I, I'm sorry, I run my music through a Sonos system. So I can't just say play music and have it appear on my stereo, which is what I'd like to do. And what I could do if that Sonos app and Siri could talk to one another. If I could get Siri to control my lights, I'd be ecstatic. <laughs> Brett, too, you said that you're working on, or you have a system that you can turn on lights from your from your watch. I yeah. assume that's an Apple Watch. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So, do I need to be? Am I going to be walking around all the time saying, "No, I can't do it here again," because I'll trigger some, I'll trigger everybody else's. But you know, hey, you, um, you know, do this, do that, do the other. Or is it a better idea to have? have a device like an, an Amazon Echo sitting here listening to everything that goes on in my house. Well, see, for me, the dream has always been proximity and motion detection. If I walk into a room, light should come on. When I walk out, they should go off. Light should just follow me around the house. That's what I've, that's what, that's been my goal for years. It's very difficult to accomplish in a way that doesn't upset your significant other. Um, it's 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 okay if it works and you're the only person in the house but my watch is only really for overriding those automated commands like i mean i really don't want to have to think about lights i just want to walk in and you know there's light so and then sh shut shut off behind me so i save the electricity my watch is like if i'm standing on the back porch and all the lights in the house are on and i want to look at stars i can just pull up my watch and tap a workflow uh, from glances and it'll shut the whole house off but for the most part i'm not walking into each room and and saying something or tapping a button that would be highly annoying to me hmm. but the thing about proximity is that i i know i'm used to turning lights on and off i've been doing it all my life and i'm it's just a natural motion for me and it's not an issue but when my nieces come over they consistently leave the bathroom lights on and i run through the house after they've been here turning lights on that they've left off or turning lights off that they've left on. And so they're not wearing Apple watches and they're not triggering lights. So is it better to have a system that's based on proximity as well as programming that I give it that says, you know, after a certain period of time, oh, yeah. the lights should just go off. So the point is, you know, flexibility. Well, and, and that's that the, solves like the problem takes, of living with other people as well. It takes that whole combination. Like you have proximity, but then you also have motion. Then you also have timers. And that's the kind of stuff that people don't want to think about. Yeah. Like my system is very, it's all full of fallbacks and backups. If this happens and then this happens, but this doesn't happen, then do this. And it, it, it gets nuts. And, and proximity with Bluetooth, like if I'm above this room and in my house, my phone will still tell it I'm in this room and my lights won't turn off. Bathrooms are easy, by the way. You just put a door sensor and doors closed, lights are on, doors open, lights are off. That one's simple because your door is always closed when you need the light. So, um, but really. yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> Not in my house. <laughs> That's that maybe too much information. Um, <laughs> it's not intended to be, but that, that, that's, I, there was sort of a point behind it. Just that there's if there's enough uh, easy to access apps that allow you to create conditions. That I mean, obviously, you you set a set of conditions that work for the way your lifestyle is. Uh, that may be entirely different than mine or anybody else's. And those things are hard unless something like uh, an Apple interface makes it easy for us to make those choices. And that's hopefully what you get with, with HomeKit when they come out with new and, 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 and APIs that, connects that connect to apps. I think we've set up very high expectations. Sure, of course we have. That's the, that's the fun of it. <laughs> yeah, but you know... Uh, right now, I'm struggling with with the idea of the Brett you're talking about because I, I I get what you're trying to accomplish and and I can see some very definite advantages, 
But I can do some of that right now with just a, a simple little switch um, that I can pick up at Target and, yeah. and plug in the wall. You know, I've, I'm sure you've had the same experience where you go to a ho certain hotels. They've come up with the idea they want to save electricity. So I'm in the shower, and if I'm in the shower too long, the lights go out. And then I got to stick my arm out and, and wave it to get the sensor. And then, oh, I wouldn't yeah. go back to that hotel. Well, you know, <laughs> nice hotel, except for that. But it's so you're, I, I like the idea of the fallbacks and, and everything. But see, well, in, in like a Wemo, a set of Wemo switches can do, you know, in a limited capacity what, what I want. But when you start branching out and you want garage door sensors and humidity sensors and all of these things that aren't part of that system, then you need something larger. So it depends on scale, really. I mean, a lot of the, the frustrations and problems that I've dealt with over the years come from wanting to, uh, you know, I want HAL. I want something, I want a controlled environment. And uh, it, it, it's not really possible, but I have pulled a lot of hair out um, trying to make that happen. <laughs> this edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile the makers of PDF Pen, PDF Pen Pro, PDF Pen for iPad and iPhone, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander, Text Expander Touch, and Disc Label. Find out more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. The Smile team has been busy again, rolling out small but significant improvements to two of my favorite productivity utilities. The latest version of PDF Pen improves scanning significantly from both a performance and reliability standpoint, making it faster and more stable than ever. Faster and more stable are always good things, especially when you're trying to churn through a pile of PDFs of contracts or research papers, or even just old magazine scans. Whatever you're trying to get into PDF Pen as editable text, you will now do it faster and with even greater reliability. The latest version of Text Expander fixes the secure input notification that was so annoying in the Chrome browser and also improves suggested snippets by excluding most single words found in a dictionary. That second one is huge, since it improves one of the very best new features of Text Expander, the ability to recognize and suggest snippets for your frequently typed text. If you pay attention to the suggestions, you'll be surprised at just how much time and effort Text Expander can save. Of course, those are just a couple of the features of these two great programs. For example, PDF Pen lets you redact information from prying eyes. And I don't just mean cover it up, I mean redact it so that it's gone from the PDF Pen you send the opposition. And Text Expander doesn't just insert text. You can load all sorts of things into a snippet. Images, graphic signatures, HTML code snippets, and much more. You need to try out both of these great utilities, and you can do it for free by going right now to smilesoftware.com and downloading the free demo versions. Then buy directly from Smile when you're ready, and enjoy their regular stream of updates that just keep making their software and your life better. That's smilesoftware.com for free demo versions of Text Expander and PDF Pen. Do it now and tell them Chuck sent you. Smile, the makers of world-class software. Thanks to Smile for being the longest-running sponsor of Mac Voices. So, so at what price? At what price? Shall we? I know you mm -hmm. said you I don't. don't <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to ask Shall we, Brett, because I'm afraid of what your answer is. <laughs> but, but Shall we? You know what? I mean, some of these switches. You know, some of what we're talking about can be done now to a limited degree. But the cost benefit, the, the the ROI is just seriously in question, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, would I would I like to be able to walk in and say, "Hey, somebody, turn on the lights, turn on the living room lights"? Absolutely. Do I want to pay forty or fifty dollars to do it for each light? No, I don't think so. I think I put my cards on the table up at the top. The lights are the least that I want. I want maybe a garage door sensor I want maybe I guess what I would bring it down to is I, I want specific things I want kitchen related automation things that have to do with timers and shopping lists and uh, uh, preheating ovens and stuff like that but I have been able to turn on the lights for as long as I've been alive and I don't need or wish a controlled environment that doesn't mean that's a bad thing it just means that 
those those seem like the kinds of things because you have to have a unit at each instance it seems um that are going to cost more money than I'm personally willing to invest. But I love the idea that the technology exists so that Brett can have as many lights in an automated a fashion as he wishes <laughs> and that I can just make my kitchen do what I tell it. Well, and that, that's, that comes back to a point you made, Chuck, where, well, actually, I think both of you mentioned it, but the, the, uh, the utility and the uses of home automation are going to be extremely customized. Like everyone's going to have a different you know, goal or a different scope. You can't just sell light switches and expect everyone to come up with a configuration that works because you need smart TVs and smart ovens and nobody's going to want the same package. So that does mean a lot of individual modules, which increases cost. And it does mean the software would have to be brilliant to be just, you know, two click setup for everybody. And I don't think it would work for anybody. I, I tend to agree with you. I tend to agree with you, and I, and I really like your observation that we're all going to want something different. Right now, honestly, I'm kind of trying to figure out what I would want. And and again, there's a cost benefit analysis in there. Um, but you know, lights, uh, okay, you know, that's fine. But I don't want it enough that I've gone and spent any money, even on a U light bulb. Um, the the ring doorbell, yes, for for security and for. Um, for a number of other reasons, I, I like that idea. Uh, look, and there's a little geek appeal to it too. There's no question about it. But I start to yeah, and walk in at night, and the stereo pops on. Okay, fine. TV pops on. Yeah, it might might be nice. Um, it, you know, if I can if I can kind of choose which one or how I want want it to happen. But more and more, I, shall we? What you were saying about the kitchen. Um, Expound on that a little bit, because I, what kind of things would need to be connected for you to feel like you were getting a benefit from it? Well, I want a little more of what I already have. Obviously, I can tell Siri to take a note, and I can make a grocery list. I would like that to work a little better, and with the apps of my choice. I use Evernote a lot for grocery lists, because it's always on whatever device I'm on, and it's it has features that I like. Uh, and I'd like to be able to choose my list application. I'd like, uh, I use my iPad to read recipes often and I hang the iPad in ways so that I don't have to touch it. But I would like to page through a recipe uh, with my voice. I guess it comes down to I want to do an awful lot by my voice in the kitchen so that I don't have to wash my hands and touch my devices. And so I want a little more of what I already have. But then I would like um, and this isn't about automation so much. It, it, it may be about the app, so that you design an app so that a recipe essentially is either a series of slides or a series of web pages or something, so that I can say, uh, read me the next page, and then when I've acted upon it, I can say next, and it'll move along and it'll tell me what to do, and there will be timers available to me if I want it. Some of, again, some of that already exists, so it's just a matter of integration. And then I'd like to say, preheat oven to 450, and then when the oven is preheated, it will announce it if I'm not in the kitchen or it will be my, my current oven beeps at me. And if I'm in the kitchen, that's great. And if I'm not, then um, I'd like it to to announce it to, to me wherever I am in some fashion. And then um, um, I have a, a bar that's separate from my kitchen. And so I don't know, something to do with cocktail automation, but I haven't quite figured it out. Something to do with uh, having the recipes on the bar so that I don't have to carry the iPad in there with me or that the, the voice will uh, th maybe it'll just send a text to my phone. I haven't figured it all out, but but it, it all revolves around being able to be more efficient while I'm doing a task that involves me physically moving around and not wanting to uh, touch devices. Hmm. I've done a lot with the leap in that area as well. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Okay. I, Tell you, us about the leap. If you search my blog for Minority Report Desk, there's a video of... <laughs> I have a, a treadmill desk, and then w when I'm walking faster, I have my leap motion set up so that I can page through um, like uh, news stories and uh, and move uh, space to space and read multiple applications just by waving my hands. That's really the only time that's practical, and when you're cooking, uh, because most of the time it's way less energy to just type on a keyboard. But when you're already active and typing is hard. Yeah, like a quick swipe of your hand mm -hmm. to move an application is great. And same in the kitchen. Oh, and Paprika and Sous Chef and Gourmet, something, they all have voice control for paging through recipes. What I want is a fridge that tracks your, your pantry. 
So like when you run out of something, you just tap a button on the fridge and it adds it back to your shopping list for you. I kind of uh, like that too. Okay. Thank you for, for taking me there. I was hoping somebody would because I'm one of the few people that doesn't think that the Amazon buttons are stupid. I would agree with you. Okay. I don't think they're stupid. I don't shop for Amazon for groceries at Amazon, but I, the idea is not a bad one. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, okay, so it's it's going to be tricky, I think, to monitor how much. And, and one of the panels that couldn't join us tonight um, sent me an email, and, and I'll use part of his example. It's going to be tough for it to track my orange juice unless there's a pressure sensor or a weight sensor of some, some kind. And then that's going to get into I'm going to have to buy the same carton of orange juice every time so it knows what it's pre-calibrated for. And, and I can't buy another carton or another size or it'll all get screwed up. But if I could, if I could, have, a, if I could have a button in the refrigerator that I push that says orange juice and have it delivered – that would be great. Orange juice refrigerated, probably not practical. Bathroom tissue, on the other hand, you know, if Amazon were not charging an arm and a leg for it, and I could get that where I just hit the button and it shows up in in two or three days. I, I mean, I don't. I I know people are upset with having brands plastered all over their house. Well, I'm not going to stick that stuff, you know, in in the living room. It's going to be in the laundry room. It's going to be behind the door. It's going to be somewhere, but it's going to be where I can hit the button and have it delivered. See, uh, our, uh, Amazon could easily add ARFID chips to like a, a box of orange juice or a bottle of orange juice and then track that chip and be able to tell when the product it shipped you had run out and then offer to restock that. I mean, it's it, it's feasible right now. You wouldn't need you wouldn't need a whole smart fridge, but you would need some kind of like the Echo could probably do it. Could probably track IDs that hadn't been thrown away or discarded yet. And once they are, if they haven't been there for a day, ask you if you want, do you want more orange juice? It could be cool. So that's the way you would you would handle it from a proximity standpoint as opposed to a consumption standpoint. I, don't, I, I mean, short of you know pressing a button or saying, I need more orange juice, uh, the only way to automatically track it, you're right. I mean, pressure sensors and, <laughs> you'd, you'd, yeah, it would get very complicated to just have a TV that, or I mean, a fridge that just knows without some kind of actual tagging system on the products. I want it for spices. And here's what I oh, want. So I have lots of spices and I use them in different quantities. And if my recipes are managed by some sort of system, it's going to know that I use a lot more cumin than I use coriander. And so when I have a quarter cup of coriander, I don't need to reorder. But if I'm down to that little cumin, Especially if it's winter time and I make my giant Christmas pot of chili, I would really like to have some cumin there for me. Yeah, and so, so if you want to track, yeah, and if you want to get all you know, get all dreamy about it, let's say <laughs> there's logic in there that knows that Shelly uses at least a half a cup of cumin a month. I just made that up. I have no idea how much cumin I use, but the machine will. So, now I, I will also say that I'm not brand loyal enough, nor Amazon loyal enough, to use what exists right now for the dash buttons, um, but. In theory, and, I mean, and there's some products I, I buy repeatedly, so I guess I have a little bit brand, brand loyalty. Spices, I tend to buy what's less expensive at the store. But there's nothing I hate worse than running out of spices halfway through a recipe. I, I would like to see the dash buttons be programmable so that I could decide, instead of it coming pre-programmed with Tide detergent, you know, maybe I prefer mm -hmm. Arm & Hammer or, you know, program it so that I can order, you know, God, I don't know what, I mean – yeah, I don't want to order an iPod case or an iPhone, excuse me, an iPhone case every you know every ten minutes. But well, maybe you chose a product like Tide, and for some reason you weren't pleased with it. And you, when you interacted with it next, you said, "Give me some additional choices or order the next on the list or something like that," so that you could indicate that that brand wasn't satisfactory to you, and that you'd like to try something else. That that, that would work. I, I, I mean, I, I respect what they're doing, and I'm sure there's some subsidies that they were able to garner out of some of those folks. But I think it would make a lot more sense to have it programmable that I could say, okay, this is okay, this is the box of Cheerios that I want to order, and you know, and I want the honey nut, not the original, and I like the big box instead. Or excuse me, I like the little box instead of the big box because the big box won't fit on my on my shelf. So be able to just scan UPC codes. Okay. Then you could just say, this is the product you're assigned to. Mm -hmm. Scan it, and you're good to go. 
and and then it feels like I mean I know you could end up with with two dozen buttons in your kitchen, especially you shall wait for spices. <laughs> but at the same time, you know it would make a, a, a lot more sense, and I think would become very practical. Well, I wonder if the buttons aren't a temporary measure in any way, because if you're using uh, tags or UPC codes or some other means, there may be, whether we have scanners or whether we have some other way to gather that information, a button is just a way to get people interested in automated ordering. And as you say, there's probably some subsidies involved, so those brands get some benefit. Just, I mean, that's where I think it could get it could get exciting, and that would require a human intervention, me, to do a little bit of setup. But if it means that much to me, and it's one less thing than that I have to kind of manage, I mean, that would be great. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, it seems like I run out of laundry detergent at a surprising rate. I don't know why. Um, or at least maybe it just seems that way because I, I go to do laundry and then I'm annoyed. And if, if, if the last time that I I picked up that, that laundry detergent and it's like, wow, I'm, I'm almost out of this, I could just reach over and hit a button – even as opposed to walking out, or if I could, if I could just say, "Hey, you know, hey, whoops, I almost did it. Um, hey, you order, you know, this for me, and have it come." That so the, the Echo can't do that right now. I don't think so because that would be awesome if you could assign like your own keyword to a product, you know, through the Amazon website or whatever, and then just say, you know, order Tide, and it would just place the order on your default credit card and. That would be I, that would be way better than having twenty buttons that you had to label and figure out what orders what. I uh, I would agree with that, and 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 frankly, I don't know. It might it might do it, brother. Maybe it's coming, but I'm <laughs> try it right now. I don't need any more. If it's automated, you also have the ability to go back and see over time what are you consuming a lot of, and you know for for either budgetary reasons or just sort of you know managing what's going on in your house and finding out that you're drinking three gallons of milk a week and that you're not really sure how that's happening and. You may not wish to change that behavior, but it might be interesting to know that. If something. anyone would love to track that, it would be Amazon. Sure. You, like milk, you might also like cocoa. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Strawberry quick. Um, <laughs> this, <Lactose pills. laughs> this is exactly the kind of, uh, kind of discussion I wanted to have because now I'm starting to get enthused about some of the home automation. And it may not be quite as pure – Brett, is what you're trying to accomplish or what oh, you I'm have accomplished. I'm excited about the new stuff. My, everything I've done seems so archaic in light of things like this. Like, I'm excited to see things that have way broader possibilities than, you know, lights and sprinkler systems and actually, like, integrate into my life in a way that makes things easier. Because, honestly, everything I do right now just makes life harder for everybody. It's an obsession. It's a hobby, but it's not. It's nothing I could sell to someone else. So I'm looking forward to the future. You, you mean the automation stuff you've mm -hmm. done? Yeah. Uh, well, but you've, you're fulfilling a need, even if it's only yours, or the needs of someone who wants to do something similar, because at least you've done it and tested and know it can be done or it works. But frankly, I, I don't want to go through all those hoops. I, I want to buy something that is affordable, that I can plug in, answer five questions, and be up and running to some degree. And then if I'm willing to answer 20 questions, I can I can fine tune it a lot. Yeah. So I mean for you, I think you, if you if if people presented the the possibilities to you, you would start to uh, envision even more. I think you're kind of at a you're a starting point where everything works for you. You can flip a switch. You know, you can set a timer on your coffee maker. But then you start to think, what if my nest could detect when I get up in the morning, you know, if it's after a certain point where I'm clearly not going to the bathroom and then start my hot water, uh, my heater, so that I can make my AeroPress coffee as soon as I get to the kitchen. So I don't have to say, I don't have to know what time I'm getting up. Things like that start to actually, they're useful in life. You don't have to spend as much time. The difference between VCRs and DVRs. I mean, nobody would want to go back to programming VCRs when you can just, you know, have your DVR figure out. Well, what, like 10 years ago, eight years ago, I was using one that would automatically track what I was recording and then offer to record similar shows or watch schedule changes and things. Now everything's on demand, but you see what I'm saying. Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by lynda.com, the unparalleled online video training library. 
Get a full free 10 day trial at lynda.com slash Mac voices. I could spend pretty much every information spot for lynda.com telling you about the great new courses they're adding because they're always adding great new courses, in-depth courses, courses for tech, business, personal development, video production, photography, and much more. Courses like problem solving for web professionals, which is interesting even if you're not a web professional. Teamwork fundamentals, because everyone has to work in teams sooner or later. Exploring Photoshop, mastering curves, just one of so many great Photoshop titles. Foundations of IT security, core concepts, for those wanting to get into IT security. I can think of a couple companies who have been in the news recently who could really have used this. Media training, a course I wish every single person who ever worked a trade show booth would watch, rather than having to go look for someone with media training. Or designing icons for the web, because an eye-catching icon can make all the difference in the perception and success of a product. Those are just a few of the very latest titles in lynda.com's ever-growing library of great training titles that can teach you something about just about anything. You can watch what you want, when you want. And with lynda.com's iOS app, you can watch where you want by downloading courses to your iPhone or iPad. No internet connection necessary. You should really think about joining lynda.com and learning something new. Right now, by visiting lynda.com slash macvoices, you can give it a try for a full 10 days of unlimited viewing, unlimited topics, free. Just sign up and start watching. Any course, any subject, new or old, it's yours for the viewing. At the end of 10 days, you will realize just how much you've come to rely on lynda.com as a place to go not only to learn new skills, but also to improve existing talents. That's lynda.com slash macvoices for your 10 free days of learning. Do it right now and learn something new today. Thanks to lynda.com for their support of Mac Voices. I think that's brilliant. I think that's that's a perfect example of a place where it did work until we got on demand and we can de- we could debate that's a whole other show to debate whether <laughs> whether it's better or not. But the whole idea that, you know, yes, if if I were taping uh, the tonight show every night uh, manually, it would say pretty soon, hey, you know, why don't you get a season pass or why don't I just set it for you? And if you're doing that, maybe you would like the Late Late Show and, you know, whatever whatever else. So that, yeah, that, that was an automation system that works. It was a recommendation system that did seem to work. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I think, well, see, and it's, again, it comes back to Amazon. Am- nobody has ever upsold me as much as Amazon. And if Amazon could apply those kind of tracking and basic machine learning algorithms to my everyday life and just suggest, you know, be one step ahead of me, what am I going to do next and how can you help me do it faster? That that's I think that's ultimately a goal that everyone could see a use for. That's when it would be worth the investment of something just literally figured out what to make easier so you didn't have to think about what to change and what to program, a learning system. Shall we, is this an opportunity for Apple to partner with Amazon? Perhaps. I'm not sure whether they need to or not, or whether what Apple does is more elemental, because we've sort of gone down this uh, Amazon Amazon and product-oriented path, which is an interesting path, but home automation is uh, sort of bigger than having things arrive at your doorstep. Um, so if Apple creates fundamental interfaces that Amazon can tap into, they could certainly partner with Amazon. But Apple is sort of quirky about partnerships. And they, Amazon being another sort of big dog, I kind of wonder if Apple would prefer to facilitate Amazon doing what it does rather than, you know, being in bed with them directly. Uh, and, I, you know, I personally hope that whatever they do in terms of products is broader than Amazon because I am not comfortable with the Amazon ecosystem being all inclusive in my life. It's just not something I I personally would choose. And I'd like to be able to do some, do some of these automation things that do involve products uh, without feeling like Amazon was my only choice. And that's, that's just a personal choice I'd like to keep for myself. I I totally agree with that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's um, the Apple has wavered a lot over the years on whether or not they want to provide open APIs to let everyone hook into, 
which benefits by creating a larger ecosystem, or whether I want to keep it completely locked down, as we've seen more and more in recent times. It's really frustrating to have Apple provide, you know, a really good solution, but one that can't be expanded, one that Amazon couldn't access. And I, I get frustrated. APIs for me as, as a hacker are everything. Mm -hmm. And I know they're probably not always financially feasible or sound decisions, but I wish Apple would just create the technology, create the system for their ecosystem, and then just add the API and the hooks so that everyone can go nuts with it. And I've been, we've been talking about Amazon and I, I mean, I'm an Amazon prime member because I've, I like having things come, you know, second day, um, and for, for quote unquote free, obviously it's not free. I'm paying the membership. Um, and you know, for a reduced price, if I, if I really absolutely positively need it the next day, I, I, I like that. They seem to have the logistics figured out. They've also found a way to get me to pay for it, in a sense. The more stuff I buy from Amazon, the better value it is. I don't find that. It probably would be a little more Apple-like to, to partner with somebody like Target. But Target doesn't have the logistics worked out to that degree. That's that's kind of my concern. And, you know, geez, we're, we're talking about home automation here. So we want as instant a gratification as we can get. I mean, Shelly could not be able to make her chili without the right spice. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm starting to really the dark. like the idea of on December 15th, it knows that I always make chili between Christmas and New Year's, and it says you better lay in some cumin and some dried peppers because you're not going to be able to go shopping on Christmas Day, and if you'd like us to deliver it to you now, you'll be ready for when you make the chili and the hot buttered rum that happens on Christmas Eve, you know? <laughs> well, and that's why we keep talking about Amazon, is you're know, right. They're the, only, they're the only ones who have proven in the marketplace that they can deliver on that kind of predictive, you know, tracking. And I agree. I don't want Amazon to rule the world. I don't want to buy everything from Amazon. I'm a prime member. I very much enjoy what I do order from Amazon. But if the ecosystem evolves to a point where it's just default, if I need something, it's coming from Amazon, that would be, that would be a kind of killer for me. I might find myself off the grid then. Uh, I, I missed the point, Brett. Why? Um, I don't like the idea of not having choice. I don't like the idea that, that my system got so wrapped up into Amazon and or Apple that I, I, I wasn't in control of my purchasing, sourcing, and things like that. Plus the amount of information that I, you would have to share for Amazon to predict things like you know Christmas chili. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're looking at some, some cons privacy concerns. Yeah. <sighs> You know, I, I'm not the first one to make this make this statement, but if you want some of this stuff, and, and I'm not chiding you, Brett, by any oh, no. but but because it, it applies to me. The convenience more, versus privacy. Exactly. The, well, n not just convenience, but um, but predictability. I mean, the the more things, so, something simple. The more times I click on a like or don't like button on Apple Music or Spotify or Pandora, the better chance that they can predict what I like. I'm sharing information that may be trivial information as to what kind of music I like, but it's still the same principle. The more I tell Netflix and some of the other services, the movies, the kind of movies I like, the better chance that they're going to feed me something or recommend something that I do like. So the same thing is going to be true with my, my bath soap and my laundry soap and my deter my my dishwasher soap and I don't the know why I'll, I'll come up with soap. See, well, I don't accept I, that see, premise, like at least for myself. My, my experience with recommendations, and I've used Netflix and I've used Apple Music and I've used various recommendation engines, and a lot of them, some of them work better than others. Apple has particularly not worked for me. And I don't mind that it exists, but I, I don't see that as – a feature, and I would like the ability to not only opt out, but but have choices, and especially when it when it's concerning, you know, buying products and stuff like that. I may not get all I want in terms of automation and getting it there tomorrow by not using Amazon all the time, but that's a choice I I get to make. And I, you know, if if I have to go out and remember to buy my cumin and my dried peppers, well, that I just will. It, it doesn't. It's not that hard a choice for me and I as long as I've got those choices uh, 
hopefully there will be other players in the market that maybe not on as broad a scale as Amazon, but maybe in a limited scale. And maybe it's, you know, their, their food delivery service. There's a service here locally called Favor that I think is in several other markets, and they do delivery. They're not doing predictive. They're not doing automation. It is app-based. But the point is, their, their niche is going out and bringing stuff from local supply, local vendors. Usually it's food, but it's other things as well that I want. And I like that that's an option. I like that they would have the ability based on an open API to connect to Apple or to other ecosystems in some way, and that Amazon wouldn't be my only choice. See, okay. So so the the privacy versus convenience thing is a whole nother episode. Right, right. Because we've been, you know, debating this for years. And the problem is it's it's at small scales, it's great. When you're just working in Pandora and Pandora is getting better because you like songs, that's absolutely way more convenient than it is privacy invasion. But if you get into an uh, Amazon ecosystem like we're talking about, or as is currently the case with Google and Facebook, they start tracking everything across all different aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. And yes, it, it provides amazing convenience and features, but it also allows them to create a profile. Once you have that much information, you know a person. You know, it, it's not just where you've been on the web. It's, not, it, I mean, we're talking about it knows when you're home, it knows when you get up, it knows when you go to bed, it knows where you go, it knows what you buy. That's enough to be a serious concern. And it doesn't get like that until you're at a large scale and the amount of information that someone like Google has, th it does become a concern to me, especially when, mm -hmm. you know, Hal goes crazy and, you know, the, uh, your house is out to get you and it knows everything about you. I know that's, that's paranoia, but it, it's a, it's a massive, if it's just being used to make my life better, great. But we've seen that there are other uses for that information and we can't, we're never promised anything. Okay. So just for the sake of argument, I, first of all, I, I happen to believe that the profile is already built. It may not be crystal clear, but I think there's there's a pretty good profile because you use your credit card, you know, you you you're being tracked by GPS because of your phone. You know, if if somebody really is out there and has the ability to aggregate this stuff, and I believe that there are entities that probably do, and I'm not wearing a tinfoil hat, folks, but you know, it, it's just I think it's the reality of the 21st century that we live in, that those profiles are built pretty well because I know listen, I know just how much junk mail I get that is re. It's not well targeted, but it's I, I can I, I know why it got here. You know, I know why I get certain credit card offers and I know why I get certain catalogs because somebody's paying attention to the way I do spend or what I do buy. Right. But your concern is the aggregation. And if you dedicate yourself to, you know, Amazon everything, they don't need to aggregate anymore. They just have it. And that's right. you know, if if you if you think about the the Potential results of aggregating all that data and then just put it all in one place to begin with, you've removed the only hurdle to like separating the various modes of your life. But but to, shall we to go back to what you said though, I I'm I'm in control. I, at least I think I'm in control. Maybe I'm not. But I don't I, I don't find Hunt's ketchup showing up on my doorstep because Amazon said so and I prefer Heinz or or vice versa. You know, it's just okay. If if I if I type ketchup in Amazon search field, I'm probably more likely to come up with Heinz ketchup. But but I, I think Brett's right about the amount of information in one place and the ability with with big data to whether you want to call it manipulated or whether you want to just say know more about me than I particularly care to have it know. I mean, you're an example of what ketchup. I don't. I don't care that they know what ketchup I use. I do, I mean, it's a small scale thing, but I do care that if I'm in a browser and I go and do a search for a product, that that product shows up on the right side of my Facebook page. And that reminds me every time that happens, what I don't like about giving that much information away via the web. Uh, and that's not even stuff I've purchased. That's just stuff I've looked at. And so uh, Amazon exists to a great degree to be a gratification engine. That prime membership that you, you pay for is actually super cheap for them because they're giving you the free shipping, but the fact that it's so easy for you means that you give them more data and you take more stuff from them, and it's just it's just a great exchange for them. And if you do so uh, in, in knowledge and acceptance of the amount of information that they have on you, 
then you're welcome to do that. But I just f feel bad when I, the, the the number of prime uh, prime customers I hear who just extol the praises of Amazon because of how tremendously awesomely wonderful it is without a second thought to the amount of data that's being gathered. You know, not to mention you know corporate practices, which we don't have to argue about. But I just I don't like that large a, a, a monolith. Mm -hmm. Uh, being that much in control of not only what they know about me, but, uh, you know, my gratification and literally pushing my buttons or my pushing theirs. And that's, that's I, I would like to continue to have that choice. And I just like to continue to, to advocate that people be, you know, knowing uh, customers and, and, and uh, realizing just how much information and what uses that can be put uh, that a company like Amazon maintains in exchange for your Prime membership. I, I can't help but say it. I think that there is, you, you said, if you're pushing their buttons or they're pushing yours. I think there's a mutual pushing because, I, yes, we are giving information. And, yes, Amazon probably does know a lot more about me because of my Prime membership. On the other hand, I'm I'm getting something back for that. I'm not giving it away. You're not, See, it's not it, – the concern is not that mis ketchup missiles are going to show up. The concern – I mean, right now it is – it seems to us like it's all convenience. Like nobody's hunting us down. We're not on the run. No one's uh, manipulating and 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 sending us to court with invalid information. But the possibility is entirely there. Once that information is there, if things change in the future, you don't get that information back. It's a it's it's a, it's a slightly paranoid, but with recent NSA revelations and whatnot. It, it makes you start to question whether you want that data to exist or not, even if right now it's just being used to send you better junk mail. Or know what movies you watch. Right. And, and yes, I love that stuff. And, and for the longest time, I was absolutely, I will give up, you know, this part of my information to this company in order to get really good recommendations, in order to get really great convenience. And then you start to realize things like Facebook tracking and Google, Google bubbling and the amount of just web related activities that are changed by information you aren't even aware you're giving away anymore. And then you start to think of the uh, more uh, 1984 ish possibilities and things. I don't know. It gets a little scary, especially after you watch citizen four. Well, and I feel like too, the younger Younger people who grow up with in this ecosystem, kids who have dash buttons in their house and uh, who, as adult consumers, start making uh, Amazon Prime one of the first things they buy when they get their own apartments, they're not going to have thought about a world in which this doesn't exist. And therefore, your, uh, your willingness to share information is not as mitigated by your concern that, you know, whether you fear the government or whether you fear the large company out there, or whether you fear hackers that would take that information and do nefarious things, uh, people who live in an entirely gratification-based uh, universe are not going to have the tools to make those kinds of decisions. So, <laughs> agreed. This this has to be one of the fastest shows. I, I'm just looking at the time, and I can't believe how fast this has gone. I I want to wrap up with with one thing um, to to sort of bring it full circle, and especially to bring it back around to the Apple ecosystem. We expect to see some upgrades to Siri next week, and and that's not rumor. That's more expectation, I think, than rumor. What would what are the one or two things that you'd like to see from a, a Siri slash home automation side next week? Shall we? Well, I'm actually looking forward to the universal search and uh, Siri control of Apple TV. I don't have an Apple TV right now, but especially if Apple TV becomes uh, the center or a center of home kit and app opportunities, I, I love the idea that I can uh, control things by voice. And uh, that has not only just implications for fun and whiz bang and awesomeness, but from the point of view of somebody who cares about accessibility, uh, voice activation and voice control and voice feedback is such an awesome uh, way to get around some of the issues uh, to deal to do with uh, you know screen only based interaction. So I'm really looking forward to Apple TV and Siri playing nice together. Brett, I, I would totally echo that. Uh, the deep linking and universal search on at least on Apple TV is going to be amazing on iOS too. But uh, the uh, API, you know, if if we can see some way to start extending it 
uh, for developers to start building onto Siri. That would be absolutely amazing. And I would like Siri to, uh, I, my biggest problem with Siri is when I say, hey, Siri, she comes up and then immediately stops listening. And then I have to go hit the mic button again. And that stuff drives that me nuts. <laughs> it, it makes me feel like I'd be better off, you know, just doing it myself. Um, and especially with the Apple Watch. So I would just like to see improvements in performance overall, which I think, I mean, the new uh, watch OS and the new Apple TV OS are both going to to take care of a lot of that. The one thing I like to see, and, and this has come from my time with the uh, with the Echo, is that I do think we need to have at least an option to turn on the ha, have something somewhere, whether it's an Apple TV or whether it's it's its own little box, but something that I can put, and that's my that's my command center. That's what I can say, hey. You know, Brett, you already triggered everybody's devices, so I'll, I won't. But you know, hey, you, uh, you know, add this to my add this to my shopping list. Remind me to do this. Put this on my calendar. I love it, and and because I I was addicted to to the iPhone before with that. Um, now I've become even more addicted to it with with the Apple Watch when I can just reach up, and now I don't have to hit any buttons. Now I can just say hey, and it you know it it's rolling, um, and I find that. Especially at, at this proximity, it's really good. I yeah. mean, it's really good. The recognition so. is great. It's just the uh, just stopping. Like it starts. I get like two words out, and then I'm still talking. And meanwhile, it's giving giving me back the first two words of my sentence and said, "I don't know what you mean." Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, I get that a lot. I, I honestly, I don't use Hey Siri very much for. The, sorry, sorry, sorry. You know, instead <laughs> of explicit tags on podcasts, you should have a Siri trigger. Tags on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I may actually do some dropouts here to make sure we yeah, aren't, aren't, aren't triggering devices all over the place. Uh, guys, this is I'm, I'm telling you, this has been fascinating. We, we went in directions I never anticipated, and I hope uh, we get to come back and do it again maybe uh, after the Apple announcement or a little farther down the line and see what progress we've made, see what else Brett has rigged up so that uh, <laughs> wherever he walks, things New things toys. Move. New toys. Yeah. Um, shall we once again give us website and uh, and um, uh, Twitter links and everything else? Uh, Brisbane.net, B-R-I-S-B-I-N.net is my uh, main site. You can find all the things I do, including the brand new Parallel podcast, uh, my book on iOS accessibility, iOS access for all. And if all of that went by too fast, just look me up on Twitter, Shelly, S-H-E-L-L-Y, and I'm always there. Great. Brett? Uh, I'll make this easy. Um, T-T-S-C-O-F-F will work everywhere, including if you add a .com, you'll get to my website via that where you can also get to in my my uh, podcast and my products and things like that. So, uh, TT scoff. That's, that's it in a nutshell. Great. And you'll, you'll have that uh, little utility. What, what, um, what is a script or utility that you were talking about consolidating the windows? It's a workflow. It's a workflow. Okay. So that'll be up there ready oh, to go. Yeah. <laughs> so all kinds of good stuff. Yeah. Poke around Brett's site. You'll find something. I, will, I look forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. You'll find stuff that, will make you a little crazy yeah. because you can't figure out how he did it. You'll end up like me. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Controlling my lights and my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Brett. That's Brett's Controlling real Controlling my lights with the blink of an eye. That's what yeah. I'm after right now. <laughs> oh, 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 boy. Oh, boy. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks. you. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. I don't know what's going to happen next week, but uh, this has definitely been an interesting conversation. It's made me think a little bit. I hope it's made you think. If it has... Drop me a message on Twitter. I'm, I'm at Chuck Joyner. I'd love to hear what you think about some of this, what your experience has been with home automation, what your concerns are about privacy and confidentiality and everything else. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. 
bandwidth provided by CashFly at CashFly.com.